Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Riverfront. This is episode number 454 of the World's Most Dangerous Podcast, where we discuss the Cincinnati Reds and occasionally uh, Luis Quinones. I'm your host, Chad Dotson. With me this week, is uh, we, we've sort of talked back and forth about doing this. We finally sat down and picked a date. Excited to have the, uh, the, the broadcaster for the Daytona Tortugas, Reds High uh, Single A team. Uh, Army women's basketball and other things. Uh, we're going to touch on as much of that as we can. Justin Rock, how are you today, Justin? I'm doing fantastic, Chad. Thank you so much for taking the time to to have me on. I really appreciate it and uh, looking forward to it. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I'm interested in what you do, and I know that a lot of our uh, our viewers are going to be interested as well. I want to just kind of um, mention the the first time that we met in person. You know, we'd sort of got to know each other a little bit on on Twitter there, but the first time in person, I believe, if I'm remembering correct, it was in Johnson City, Tennessee. Is that where it was? That that is correct. Uh, Greenville Reds against the Johnson City Cardinals in uh, in the original uh, iteration of the Appalachian League. Yeah, for sure. That's right. In that old uh, ballpark, Cardinals Park in Johnson City, and what what I, occurred to me at that time was, and this is something maybe you can uh, talk about because I'm not sure people really quite understand, was all the work and the preparation that it took from you to, but before the game to get ready and then to actually broadcast the game and all the moving parts, it was, I was like, man, I, I'm glad he's doing it because uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's people just think, oh, you sit down behind a microphone and talk about baseball for three hours and man, it's way more than that. So can you just kind of give us an idea what the, the day-to-day uh life is for you uh as as a broadcaster um yeah you know it, it's definitely a lot different uh in the minor league baseball realm for me than i would say you know it is in uh you know the the off season when i'm, I'm freelancing doing basketball and, and other sports um but you know in baseball i'm doing media relations in addition uh to doing the play-by-play stuff and so i'm doing a lot more uh than just broadcasting as you said you know i'm getting to the ballpark and making sure you know game notes are ready to go we've got uh, stat packs for the the coaching staffs and for the, you know any media that might show up at the ballpark that day. Um, getting lineups, um, producing any sort of uh, material for fans. You know, printing rosters. Um, you know, keeping your 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 eyes peeled on emails for uh, things like roster moves and. You know, maybe there's a press release that needs to go out about something in regards to maybe an upcoming homestand or an upcoming promotion. Um, so there's all those kinds of things moving on, going on, you know, generally from the time you get into the office um, until about like maybe three, four o'clock. And then, you know, the closer you get to game time, you know, you start more and more focusing your attention on, you know, what's going on with the game, getting lineups, making sure lineups are, are printed and, you know, uh, are, are you know, available to whoever necessarily needs them uh, on a game day basis, make sure it gets to whoever needs it uh, on the concourse of the lineups up. So the fans know what's going on. Um, and then, you know, you know, getting interviews, making sure you have some, some content for the pregame show and, and things like that. And then, you know, the job isn't done also when the game is over, you know, we're running off uh, box scores for coaches uh, so they can see that right in the post game recap, you know, cleaning up the press box, making sure everything's, you know, locked up in the stadium and the teams at home and things like that. So um, it, it's a never ending uh, kind of a, a cycle of different kind of things uh, around the ballpark, around the stadium uh, that goes into uh, being a, a broadcaster and media relations person in, in minor league baseball, a lot more than, you know, just what goes on between uh, the first and final pitch. Yeah, and I, 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 that's, I'm glad you ex- sort of explained all that because I, I did a, a huge disservice, frankly, to you as in the introduction by just saying broadcaster because that's the the glamorous part. And if you get a chance and you can listen to, to Justin call the games, thanks to the uh, the the interwebs, uh, you should because you can you can you, you can tell when a broadcaster has put in that preparation work and uh, uh, is not just going through the motions. It's it's obvious because it's a hard job if you don't put it that time. But yeah, when when it comes to certainly what you're doing. Uh, now with Daytona is it's a it's a one stop shop in some ways for for media relations and it's a uh, I imagine it's a, a huge time intensive job I imagine it's also fun at times but also it's got to be a, a a serious workload yeah no it, it definitely is um, you know it definitely takes a, a lot of time you know uh, I, I like to joke a lot of times with people that for the most part during the minor league season it's sort of get up go to work come home go to sleep and, and very much sort of that kind of routine a lot of times. Um, uh, but it is a lot of fun because, you know, you know, the old theory is, you know, beats the daylights out of, 
you know, sitting in a cubicle at an office day in and day out, you know, I'm, I'm staring at, at a ballpark in Florida, um, you know, got this beautiful view of, of the bridge and the Halifax River. And, you know, you're right off the uh, the Atlantic Ocean, all this kind of stuff. So um, it, it definitely is exhausting and, and time intensive uh, between, you know, getting ready for the play by play, making sure you're prepared and and you've got all your research done. So, you know, what you're talking about uh, when the lights are on, but also making sure all the different things uh, are taken care of on a, on a day to day basis and also making sure, uh, you know, you know, you're, you're doing right by the fans and getting video out there, especially for us down in Daytona. We don't have MILB TV, so any sort of, uh, you know, footage we can get out there uh, of the the players and the prospects and the talent we have coming through there. Uh, so you, the fans, can see it as well and follow their success and follow their careers. You know, that's that's what we're trying to do. And, you know, it, it takes some time, but uh, it's a labor of love. Uh, yeah, no, no question. It has to be, it has to be to be, to, to do it, to do it well. Um, it's, I can't imagine someone, you can't just go through the motions, I guess is what I'm saying. Let, let me ask you this because I want to, uh, kind of get into how you got, cause I know this is a question that a lot of people have. How do you, how do you get into this, uh, this racket quote unquote, how do you, how do you start? And so you, you did it in, you did in college, right? You started yeah. in college with the, and you were, you're Penn state. Is that right? Yeah, I'm a Penn State grad. Uh, went to Penn State, um, but I knew this is what I wanted to do um, before I went to college. Um, you know, the, the old joke and the old story I like to tell people is, you know, growing up, uh, you know, in a Jewish family in, in the Northeast, you know, New York City, New Jersey area. Uh, my dad had to sit me down when I was young and, and be like, well, you know, the five day Jewish kids, nine at, times out of ten. Did not grow up to be Derek Jeter. Um, you know, you, you get your Alex Bregman thrown in there, but um, uh, <laughs> I, I was not blessed with his physical uh, physical gifts. Um, so, you know, as a as a young kid, my running theory was, well, if I wasn't going to get paid to play, might as well get paid to watch. And that's um, sort of how the dream got started. And I was an only child, so I was calling games. You know, I was playing video games in my basement, you know, playing uh, – you know, MVP baseball back in the day and Madden, all that kind of stuff. So I was, you know, playing against computer and calling, you know, the game I was, you know, playing off the screen, you know, and, and calling games off, you know, TVs. And um, when my baseball career ended, I started doing PA for uh, my high school baseball team. And that was, you know, my, my first gig and started doing stuff at Penn State and met some folks at Penn State, led me to um, an internship working two years in the Cape Cod Baseball League uh, with the Bourne Braves. Uh, my first, you know, interview uh, with somebody uh, was with uh, 2021 or actually 22 uh, Red uh, Colin Moran uh, yeah, at Doran at Doran Park in Bourne, uh, which was fantastic. And uh, you know, from there, met folks and, and led to my first job in minor league baseball in 2014, working for. Uh, uh, Brewers affiliate, the the old uh, Brevard County Manatees, which are now uh, now a defunct franchise. But, uh, you know, that was, you know, my introduction to the industry. And, and thankfully, through the connections there, I've uh, been able to to hop from place to place. And uh, you know, I'm going to keep doing this until they uh, they still they stop writing the checks. <laughs> there you go. No doubt. You know, yeah, you, you mentioned a little bit earlier that, you know, you some freelancing in the off season, And I know you do. Uh, uh, army women's basketball right yeah um, which I, I find interesting because uh you know i i had this uh thought at, when i was in college i thought i was on the road getting ready to, you know i'd applying to law schools and that was the idea and then i thought you know what maybe i need to try this other thing that that in my whole life has been something that you know i was interested in before i go and do that and so i spent i did an internship for a year with uh, virginia sports radio network um and uh, the flagship station in, in Charlottesville, Virginia. And one of the things I did was um, uh, play by play and color for a number source, but women's basketball is the one where I, I got to do all the games. Basically I would fill in on some others. I did pregame postgame stuff for the men's basketball team who they weren't as good back then as they are now, but, um, and I did some baseball as well, but uh, traveling with the women's team and uh, being able to, to, to uh, my first shot, actual, uh, play by play. I realized how hard it was. Number one, realized that um, it was a long, hard road ahead of me if I wanted to keep doing it. But um, it also gave me appreciation for the women's game that I did not have before then, because Virginia at that time were really good in, in women's basketball, and they're getting back that way. I, I hope. Um, but anyway, so that, that's a, that's sort of a, 
and entirely different things here. Women's basketball versus uh versus minor league baseball. And uh do you enjoy, I guess, the uh you know, the uh what's the word I'm looking for? You know, um variety, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely do. I think you know, my, my two passion sports are definitely uh baseball and, and basketball. Those are the two sports uh, I played the most uh growing up, you know, uh baseball. Uh, I was it was the sport I was uh, the best dad out of, out of the two of them. Um, but basketball was really the first sport, uh, believe it or not, that I uh, fell in love with. Uh, you know, my dad played pickup basketball until uh, right up until the pandemic started. Uh, my grandfather, uh, my late grandfather, played college basketball with, with Red Holzman at City College in New York, who was the head coach of the Knicks when they won uh, their two NBA titles. And I, I still have vivid memories of the one NBA game I ever got to go with him. Um, and, and Grant Hill was playing for the Pistons back before he got hurt. And he was, you know, you know, watch Grant Hill, watch Grant Hill, watch the way he plays the game. That's, you know, the right way to do it and, and all that kind of stuff. And so I, I've always had a deep passion for basketball along with baseball. And, um, you know, I've been grateful to work at West Point these last couple of years with the women's team. And it's, it's such an amazing experience, uh, working there, not only just, you know, being around, uh, my basketball team, uh, on a consistent basis and, you know, you know, traveling with them and being around them, but just uh, seeing what life is like at the, at right. the U S military Academy. Um, I never even realized, you know, I grew up only about an hour or so away from there and I never really realized how close it, it was until I took the job uh, at West point. And one of the most amazing things about it is, you know, you, you get this idea growing up outside of, uh, you know, for the most part, military, expe- uh, you know, family, you know, my grandfather, uh, served for you know in three different wars in, in you know the Air Force and the and the the Army Air Corps in World War II, but you know you get this idea of you know you know what you know soldiers are like and you get a chance to be around these girls and if you didn't know they represented you know Army West Point and the U.S. Military Academy you just imagine they were regular eighteen to to twenty two year old girls you know they're just as you know silly and and goofy and uh, you know you know like any other you know class of you know basketball players in any other school in the country they can just kill you uh, <laughs> so you know it, it's been kind of crazy you know going on you know traveling on flights with them to different places and like you know you feel like you're on the safest flight in the country because you've got uh you know 20 some odd cadets uh you know flying alongside you uh in, in the cabin and stuff like that so it, it's been amazing to meet the different people um from the officers that work with the program uh, to the players themselves um, you know, it, it's, it's just a special, special group and getting a chance to not only go there, but, uh, to, to see the folks at the Naval Academy. I know Scott Strassmeyer there is a massive Reds fan. Um, and, and we've sort of bonded over, over the Reds, uh, despite our army Navy rivalry and, and air force <laughs> as well. Just a, a beautiful, a beautiful campus there too. So, uh, it, it's been a, an amazing, amazing experience to, to, to get to see that. And uh, it was also very special to see um, getting to call a couple of his games at West Point. I was very disappointed he wasn't on our opening day roster before he did. He got moved up last year. But uh, Jacob Hurtabies, uh being in the Reds organization, double A Chattanooga, um, getting to see him at West Point, watching him play center field there. And I was like, this this dude's going to play, you know, pro ball. This yeah. kid's this kid's got it. And when the Reds signed him, it was uh, an awesome thing to see. And uh, obviously rooting for him for more reasons than one. Yeah, no question about it. Uh, you, you touched on something that I read a, l- a lot about actually in the last couple of weeks because, you know, um, around Veterans Day, a, a lot of uh, D1 teams were playing these uh, special, you know, uh, Mich- Michigan State and Gonzaga played on the, the aircraft carrier. And and I read a couple of pieces that said uh, essentially that um, I think a Houston coach, Kelvin Sampson, was quoted in one and said, I'll, I'll do this every day if I can. He went back in the offseason after doing it last time just to tour. The, he said, and they say for the, the kids on their teams, seeing these kids who are, uh, you know, um, they weren't playing against, uh, you know, Army, Navy, anyone, but but they were surrounded by it. They went on tours of the place. They were introduced to it. And all the kids came away, all the players came away affected like, whoa, you know, this, these are, you know, um, what they're learning is a little different than what we're learning. And uh, it's a really impactful thing. So it's interesting that you're getting to see that and experience it. Yeah, no, it, it really is a totally different experience. And one of the cool things, um, you know, we had a ch- coaching change a couple years ago. Our previous coach, Dave McGarity, who's a legend who actually coached at, at Marist and men's basketball for, for many, many years. 
um, then became the Army women's coach after uh, Maggie Dixon tragically passed away. Um, but, you know, he did an amazing job of cultivating, uh, of help cultivate the program um, while I was there. And one of the cool things I saw was actually, you know, UConn's women's team, he has a relationship with Gino Oriema. You know, they didn't get a chance to, to play against one another, um, but UConn came to the campus, you know, toward, you know, West Point and, you know, got, you know, the teams interacted with one another and things like that. And shortly before uh, my first year working there, um, obviously Mike Krzyzewski still has a, an incredible relationship with the people at West Point. Um, I've heard nothing but wonderful things about, you know, Coach K um, and, you know, anything Army and West Point asks uh, of him, he, he you know, he, he does with open arms, um, which is incredible. And, uh, you know, it's just so special because when they were training, I think for the 16 Olympics, uh, or something like that, you know, they came to West Point and, and had training camp and, you know, the Army women's team and the Army men's team, you know, are out there, you know, on practice with Steph Curry and, and James Harden and, and getting to, you know, talk to some of the girls on that team um, from that year, you know, my first year about that experience, you know, it's, it's things that, you know, they're going to carry with them for life. And I think those players, you know, still remember, uh, finally from their experience as well. So it, it's always amazing to see, you know, when both sides come away uh, with with really positive and, and wonderful memories of those experiences. You know, it's it's probably my fault, but I, I didn't warn you ahead of time. We have a, a, a strict policy that I, I don't allow uh, Coach K to be mentioned on this show. He's, <laughs> I was he's, I was wondering uh, that with, with your Virginia Times when I said that. I was like, is Chad going to kill me for mentioning Coach K? <laughs> but uh, That's all um, right. He's retired, so I'll have to forgive and forget, I guess. But Absolutely. Um, well, I, I guess you get the last laugh because Virginia's won a more recent national title. That's true. It is true. Um Let's get back to baseball here, if we could. What uh, has been your favorite, uh, or maybe a couple of favorites, if you can't pick one, um, but favorite stadium that you've broadcasted in uh, during your time in the minor leagues? In the minor leagues, um, I, I've been very blessed to broadcast from from a lot of different places. Um, you know, when I was working in the Southern League, there were so many uh, really cool spots. Uh, MGM Park uh, in Biloxi uh, opened it up when I was working in the Southern League with the Tennessee Smokies. Um, and, you know, right there on, on the Gulf, uh, right, you know, got the Beau Rivage Casino out beyond right field was unbelievably beautiful. And getting to see a lot of those places like I would have never expected to visit um, as a kid growing up in the New York City area. Um, you know, Mobile, Alabama was a really cool place um, before, you know, their team ultimately got uh, uh, taken away, unfortunately. But uh, Birmingham, Alabama Regents Field was incredibly gorgeous. Uh, out there as well. I, I really enjoyed my experience there. Uh, Calfee Park in Pulaski, Virginia, uh, also in, incredibly gorgeous. Um, you know, the Yankees had a facility there for, for a number of years. And it was funny, it was working actually a game uh, at William & Mary a couple or last weekend, actually, as a matter of fact, ended up having a full conversation about Appalachian League Baseball uh, and, and Pulaski, Virginia, uh, with, with somebody who worked for one of the other schools. Uh, that the Army men's team was playing against. So um, it, it's cool seeing those connections everywhere. But those were some of the, the, the favorite spots that come to my mind. But obviously also very cool working in the Florida State League. You know, you're going to all the spring training sites, you know, George M. Steinbrenner Field, uh, Clover Park, um, you know, the, the Twins facility down in Fort Myers it, it is absolutely, you know, fantastic. Um, you know, the Pirates Stadium down in Bradenton, uh, you know, just go on and on Clearwater. Uh, with the Phillies is incredible, but uh, I've also been very lucky that, um, you know, in my college career, got to, to do some games that uh, I got to do a Penn State football game at MetLife Stadium, um, got to do uh, an Army women's game from Madison Square Garden, um, which was uh, incredible. Wow. And I guess sort of, uh, you know, to tie it all back to baseball was my last Penn State uh, student broadcast was uh, Penn State's first bowl game back after the bowl ban, which was uh, the Penn Stripe Bowl at Yankee Stadium. So I, I can't say I've called a game from Yankee Stadium, albeit it was football, but uh, that was still uh, one of those moments you don't forget. So what year was that? 2014. 2014. 2014. Okay. So was it was New Yankee Stadium or old Yankee Stadium? It, it, it was it was New Yankee Stadium, Penn State that, against Boston College. Yeah, that's amazing. That's that's incredible. Uh, that, yeah. That's something that, that uh, yeah, you don't have to, you can leave out the detail that it wasn't uh, baseball because who cares? You get the broadcast. <laughs> exactly. You know, got, 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 to, got to wander around. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. That's amazing. Um, 
Let's, and, and, and let me just say here, I was, uh, you were talking about all these places and I've seen some of them. I've not seen others. Those that I want to go to. Um, and I, you threw me for a loop. I, I did not expect that uh, Pulaski, Virginia was going to come out of this conversation. I was actually born in Pulaski County, Virginia, and uh, there were the Pulaski Braves there for years. Then, of course, it was the Yankees. But That was the conversation um, I had with the guy down there, the Pulaski Braves. You remember seeing David Justice play down yeah. there in Virginia back in the day. And, um, you know, it's just, just it's amazing. That's been part of the fun part about traveling around, working in minor league baseball is, you, you know, you end up having all these connections to these different places uh you know across the united states and, and things like that and it's you know o- always fun to be able to make those different connections with people for for various different reasons and this weekend it was pulaski virginia uh, you know and i miss that appalachian league all my family lives in the appalachian league uh, footprint and uh when the reds came back they'd been in princeton uh, west virginia years ago had a team in, in the appalachian league and um when they came back with greenville i was uh, yeah we were all excited you know and i got a chance to get down to greenville a few times uh, best stadium in the uh, it's at uh, uh, tusculum college yeah, i think tusculum right? university pioneer yeah. park that's also one of the you know absolutely you know beautiful ballparks i've had Great. the broadcast got the broadcast from smoky stadium um and jackie robinson ballpark in daytona too i mean the, yeah. I, i've been blessed with some home ballparks that's that's fantastic um all right. There's a couple of things I wanted to mention. Let me see. Uh, I, I read somewhere, and I can't uh, find it now, but there was evidently a game, and it might have been when you were with uh, the Smokies. By the way, I love uh, the Smokies Park as well. We've been there many, many times when they uh, we used to take the kids down there to uh, Sevierville, Tennessee, and yep. to all that me- all that mess. But uh, uh, great park. But there was uh, some time when uh, a lightning storm or something happened. Is this ringing any bells? with you um yes it does vaguely sound familiar was it was about a, about a rain delay well i think uh, uh there was a um i've got it here somewhere here we go uh, um let's see no this is actually might have been in, in mobile alabama uh hank aaron stadium a bolt of lightning struck near the team clubhouse and yes okay i know exactly what <laughs> exactly what you're talking about <laughs> <laughs> in Mobile, Alabama, uh, working with the Tennessee Smokies, um, you know, w- was helping uh, my, my my boss Mick Gillespie down there at uh, at Old Hank Aaron Stadium, and uh, a whole lightning storm uh, came came rolling through there. And Buddy Bailey, who's uh, one of the all time leading uh, minor league uh, wins uh, leaders in terms of managers, uh, was standing out there in right field. I think like the lightning bolt. Uh, smashed near either the the clubhouse behind uh, the, behind the outfield or by the scoreboard out there, and uh, I was up in the press box at the time, and I guess there's a whole bunch of metal up with the with the press box there as well, and it uh, wasn't uh, it was, since it was an older ballpark, wasn't ADA accessible, so you had to go down you know the staircase and you sort of exposed, and one of the broadcasters there at the time. Uh, who's had a fantastic career. Her name is Melanie Newman. Um, and she is obviously now with the Orioles and has done great stuff with the MLB Network and Apple TV. But uh, she she came up to uh, the press box to save me from uh, potentially getting electrocuted or, or God knows what uh, up high in the bowels of, uh, of old Hank Aaron Stadium in Mobile, Alabama. So that, that that is my experience with Lightning. But one of the other stories I was thinking with the Smokies was um, a couple of uh, – during one of those years, I think it was probably the same season. Um, C- CBS Sports Network was doing some national games of the week in minor league baseball. And so they used our booth. We broadcasted outside from a, 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 the uh, Calhoun's Pavilion in left field. And sure enough, in like the fourth inning, a massive rainstorm comes and the game gets, you know, canceled or whatever. But during the rain delay, both teams' bullpens never went inside. And this video is still on YouTube of uh, the Smokies and the Mississippi Braves bullpens, like just going back and forth with these like almost like mini skits that they were using each other. Like one was like pretending to be like bowling pins and other was like doing like duck, duck, goose. And it all ended with both teams in this torrential downpour meeting at center field for like a, a rock, paper, scissors match. To like, quote unquote, determine who won, who won the game. Um, it, it ended up being, uh, you know. A great example of what minor league baseball is all about, guys. You know, it was probably not the smartest thing in the world to do. I'm sure the Cubs and Braves were not happy that their 
their pitchers chat out there in the rain, but um, you know, they made some memories for fans and I'm going to remember that one forever. That's fantastic. Let's, uh, let's circle back to the, to the reds for a moment here. Um, and, and I do want to talk, we have to talk about uh, LA De La Cruz because you, uh, he, uh, he obviously uh, passed through. Um, uh, let me, let me ask this question first before, and the answer may be LA De La Cruz. I'll let you say, but who, who is the best player that you rest reds, prospect best, best resume you've seen come through that you've been able to broadcast i mean i mean it, it's it's absolutely ellie i mean uh, i've been blessed to got to be with jonathan india for you know quite a bit of his first couple of years uh, after he got drafted came with us to greenville and then got to be with him uh through most of the 2019 season jose barrero uh was so much fun that 2019 season as well um i wish he stayed in the organization but josiah jojo gray uh, 2018 in Greenville was, was a load of fun. Um, you know, I'm so thrilled to see Michael Ciani uh, get up there in the big leagues. He was part of that 2018 Greenville team um, as well. But Ellie is just on another level. I mean, he might be the best, you know, prospect I, I've ever, uh, you know, been able to, to call games for. And I was, wow. you know, with the, with the Smokies, with, with Schwarber and Contreras and some of these other guys. Um, that were part of that team uh, that won the World Series. And, uh, you know, he's just unbelievable. I mean, I'll just I'll never forget, you know, the first couple of days. And, he, you know, he joined the roster. You look up the stats, what he was doing in, you know, the Arizona League and, you know, the Complex League. And you're wondering, like, okay, this kid's got some, you know, great numbers. Try and do some research and, you know, pull up baseball America and, and, you know, MLB pipeline and any sort of, you know, website that would have some sort of you know, maybe scouting report or, 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 you know, insight into this prospect that's, you know, putting up these crazy numbers as a young kid. And there's nothing, there's absolutely nothing. I remember texting Doug Gray and going like, do you know anything about this guy? I'm texting scouts. Like, do you know anything about this guy? And Doug texted me back and I still have the screenshot somewhere saying, you're going to be the first to tell us we know nothing. <laughs> and uh, sit, I remember there Bradenton's in town. I'm sitting preparing for the game and I'm hearing these loud cracks during Tortuga's batting practice. And I look down to see something that looks like this pencil hitting bombs <laughs> off the batting cages in left field. And I was like, that can't, that can't be this kid. Like there's no way. And sure enough, it was. And by four games in, I was like, how did nobody like, how is this kid falling under the radar? This kid's unbelievable. Right. Um, and I think my favorite part about Ellie and about the whole experience with him was what um, I loved about uh, Barrero and what I loved about India and what I loved about uh, Josiah Gray um, when I was with him in Greenville and so many of these other guys was he's just a great kid. Um, you know, he wants to get better. He, he, he knows he's gifted. Um, I remember when they came out with like new prospect rankings that year and he wasn't in the top 100. And I was like, you know, this list is erroneous. You know, he's not on the top 100 list. And, you know, even though, you know, he's still young, you know, basically telling me, you know, I can't remember if he told me in Spanish or English, but something along those like, you know, patience, you know, it, it, it's it's coming, you know, like I'm going to continue working. It's going to happen. And, you know, here we are, um, you know, about a year and a half or so later. And, you know, when all these prospect rank is going to come up with the top 100 come around February, March, um, he's going to be in the top 10 and he probably should be in the top five, if not higher than that. Um, so he, he's, he's special on the field. Um, uh, but if he can continue to be that, that person he was in the summer of 2021, uh, off the field. And I think he is based on being able to, to interact with him a little bit through social media and stuff like that. Um, over the year, um, you know, the, the sky's the limit and you just hope he stays healthy. And, um, yeah, no, he, the, that was, that, that was so much fun. I will never forget that summer. Yeah, well, and and hopefully the the legend will continue growing and growing and growing, and it'll uh, certainly st- continue to stand out in your mind. That's an interesting uh, point that we don't we talk about some here, but you know, in past years we've had a relationship with some of the Reds minor leaguers. And we've talked to uh, you know uh, on and off uh, the air, but um, one thing that, that that always stuck out is that there's a, sometimes a pretty wide variance between uh, the players that are really putting the work in and the players that maybe hadn't had to put in the work too much until they got there and, and um, struggled a little bit to uh, to put that the actual day-to-day work. And we see Joey Votto on a daily basis, and Joey Votto was a great, great player, but um, I firmly believe that Joey Votto became a Hall of Famer rather than just a good player because Joey Votto 
took it so seriously every day, put the work in and decided he wanted to be the best player he could be. Now, not everyone can be obsessive like Joey Votto maybe, but uh, but it's encouraging to hear that, for at least from, from your experience with Ellie De La Cruz, you got that great talent, but when you combine that with a work ethic, that's where you get a star, you know, rather than Absolutely. just a garden variety Absolutely. player. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I think, you know, uh, you know, with a lot of the different guys that are, are sort of bubbling uh, in the organization that, you know, have drawn people's attention, I think that has been a common trait. Um, I think one of my favorite parts of, you know, the early part of last season, before I even knew who Ellie was, was hearing Reese Hines and Tyler Callahan talk in our pregame, our preseason, uh, you know, press conference about, you know, work being at the uh, alternate site in 2020. And the guy that sort of helped, the guys that helped bring them under their wing and, and taught them how to be pros and how to, you know, uh, you know, attack minor league baseball life was Christian Colon, who had a World Series ring. And Jonathan India, who hadn't even made his major league debut yet. And when I heard that, it made it that rookie of the year season make so much sense. You know, he was, you know, being that kind of leader uh, off the field for for the younger players, the guys that were going to continue to follow him, even though he hadn't even stepped onto a major league diamond yet uh, with a Reds uniform on. Um, and, uh, you know, I felt that same way about, you know, you talk about the University of Virginia and, and Andrew Abbott um, and the kind of guy he was um, working with him the tail end of that same season. Um, and even this year uh, in, in Daytona Beach, you know, obviously the record wasn't necessarily uh, what you would have liked to see. But the talent uh, there, you know, particularly guys like Jay Allen um, and, and the guys that came through there, um, same sort of, you know, makeup in terms of, you know, wanting to be better on the field, but also uh, carrying themselves extremely well off the field. And that, you know, from a, from a fan's perspective, I love that. And from someone who works with them, um, just makes it so encouraging and hopeful for um, what's to come, uh, hopefully, in, in the next uh, couple of years in Cincinnati. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, that, you've, you've encouraged me a little bit, uh, certainly, because that uh, – I don't know. I'm, I can't wait to, to get to see uh, Ellie De La Cruz every single day. Um, and it's hopefully going to be this year. I don't know. You know, I, I, I imagine he's probably going to start in double A this year, but is my, my guess, or he may start in triple A actually, but um, I expect there'll be an opportunity. It's not like there's a whole lot of guys ahead of him uh, at the big league level. So they don't need to rush him. They need to make sure he's developed. And I try, I'll have to trust him to, to do that, but his ETA is sooner rather than later. And that's pretty exciting for Reds fans. Yeah. I, I would imagine, you know, if, like I said, if he can stay healthy, I think it would be, I would be stunned if he's not, you know, making his major league debut sometime this summer. I wouldn't be shocked if he starts um, in double A just to, to, to start the season, but I can see it be sort of one of those, you know, you start the season there. He, you know, goes back to tearing the cover off the ball like he was at the tail end of last season, uh, quickly bump him up to triple A. And then, uh, you know, then the, then the fun sort of starts beginning of, you know, you know, counting down the days until, you know, that moment comes where, you know, he's, uh, He's packing the crowds at Great American Ballpark and, you know, hopefully uh, being that bastion of hope that everyone, you know, hopefully isn't putting too much pressure on him to be. But uh, right. um, but obviously it, you can't ignore it either. As a Reds fan, we we need some reason to hope. <laughs> uh, I, 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 ho- I, I hope dearly that he is the guy <laughs> because he's he, he, does, he deserves to be the guy for more reasons than one. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you've probably seen me this whole episode looking around trying to uh, find someone. I'm just seen me doing that. What, what's he doing over there? And uh, the answer is that we're in the process of getting our house ready to uh, to sell. And I, I, not too long ago, I f- found something as I was going through boxes that I had no idea st- I still had. And I, and I, I finally found, I want to show it to you. Here's my, uh, my media credential for the 1996 uh, women's ACC basketball tournament. <laughs> that is fantastic. Yeah. I love it. Down to Rock Hill, it. South Carolina and, you know, flew down with the team, but um uh, they just, I don't know. It was, uh, it was fun. So yeah. hey, I, that's a great memento. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I couldn't believe I still had that. So that was, uh, that was pretty wild. So I'm just going to, I'm going to wear it. Actually, <laughs> that's fantastic. you're not the only member of the okay. media. Absolutely, here. man. It, it, it goes <laughs> well. You got, you got the, the red hat, you got the red sweatshirt and you got that's the red right. credentials. Perfect. Perfect. It, it, it was meant to be. There we go. Unfortunately, uh, Wendy Palmer and the university of Virginia Cavaliers, uh, went down to defeat, um, that day um in the in the first round of the tournament but anyway um back to back to the reds 
Anyone else that you've seen that you think uh, might be underrated a little bit? And this is an unfair question. I probably should have given you a, a heads up on that. But is there anyone that just jumps out? Just, oh, this is a guy that is interesting to me that I've watched. Um, um, the last yeah, I mean, couple there, of years. There, there, there definitely is quite a few guys. I mean, it, it was really great to see. Um, you know, I remember watching him in 2019, and, and now he's you know beginning to make had begun to make a name for himself. And Alejo Lopez, I was so thrilled with him. I loved seeing Stuart Fairchild have the success he had uh, at the tail end of of last season. Uh, those are two guys in 2019 that I was um, very high on. But you know, 2021. There were a lot of there were so many um, you know interesting guys that came through uh, through that team in terms of, of talent, um, you know relief prospects like Stevie Branch and uh, Vin Timpanelli and guys who you know maybe had a little bit of uh, you know ups and downs during their second season in minor league ball last year, but the, the raw stuff is absolutely there. That was incredibly encouraging. Um, Daniel Veohin uh, as a catcher, he has uh, you know quite a bit uh, of skill. Um, I think if he can find ways to, you know, continue to improve uh, offensively and, and be a better blocker uh, of pitches in the dirt defensively, he's got a cannon of an arm, um, a game changer in terms of, of limiting uh, what opposing teams would do uh, in terms of stealing, considering the, all the rule changes in 2021 in what was, you know, really the Florida State League to try and help increase base stealing. And he still threw out, you know, about 45 percent or whatever the number was. Uh, of, of base dealers during the course of that season. Uh, so he was incredibly uh, encouraging. And, you know, there was a, you know, there's a quite a bit of, of guys underneath there that, um, you know, sort of under the radar that didn't, you know, obviously I, I'm a big Jay Allen fan. Uh, one of the things that I, I was always impressed with, with him. And I think it's a really good point that Eric Davis made uh, when I was talking to him at one point during the summer is, you know, he had his ups and downs during the course of his first full minor league season, but this is the most baseball he'd ever played in his life. I mean, he was going from playing quarterback in football as soon as football season was over, going to playing basketball, you know, it was, was a, it was a great, you know, guard forward on, on, on his high school basketball team. And then basketball season was over. And then he was, you know, playing center field uh, on the baseball diamond. So, you know, this is, you know, the most baseball he's played consecutively. So, you know, there's going to be some, some growing pains that come, um, that come with that kind of experience. But I was incredibly encouraged by him. And then when you think back to pitching this year, um, Julian Aguiar uh, was fantastic uh, for, for us in Daytona Beach before he moved up to Dayton uh, at the end of the season. Jose Franco uh, was always encouraged by him. He's got really great strikeout stuff. If he can find consistency uh, on a uh, performance-to-performance basis, um, he's, he's somebody who could really open some eyes and, and rise quickly. Um, but there, there's, you know, there's a bunch of under the radar talent down there, or, you know, in Daytona beach this past couple of years, um, that, you know, could potentially be, you know, uh, of significance in Cincinnati in the next couple of years. Well, we need some, we need some players in Cincinnati. So, um, let's, let me, I'm going to run quickly here, uh, through the news of the week. Not a lot of news of the week. We'll talk about it a little bit more. We have a couple of questions that we'll try to answer. Then maybe we can dig into this a little bit more, but not a whole lot to discuss. The one big, uh, thing for the, from Red's perspective is that is, uh, the guy named Farmer, right? The Cincinnati Reds signed Buck Farmer, relief pitcher for the 2023 season, 1.75 million. So, uh, th- but that's not the farmer that everyone in Cincinnati is <laughs> talking about. He's talking about. Yeah, it's a different one. It's uh, the Reds traded Kyle Farmer to the Minnesota Twins. Um, in the, the Red, the Reds are getting back a guy, some guy whose name I can't pronounce. Um, who's I think Casey Legumina. There we go. You know something about him? Uh, I saw. I've, I've seen him pitch in, in Fort Myers. I want to say I may have even seen him pitch, uh, maybe in Elizabethan in the Appy League uh, as well. Um, but. Uh, no, he throws really hard. Um, you know, he's he's got some good, you know, you know, you know, qualities in terms of his his breaking pitch. You know, he's going to be, um, you know, somewhat of a, a a lottery pick in that sense. But, um, you know, if you know Derek Johnson and company can, uh, you know, uh, work some magic, he could be a big bullpen piece for them. You know, potentially. You know, I would imagine they hope to make see him make his debut sometime uh, this coming year. You would think so. He's 25 years old. And yeah, if you, frankly, if you can get a, a potentially useful piece out of trading uh, Kyle Farmer, then that's a, a pretty good piece of business given where the Reds are uh, in, 
in this uh, cycle, I guess. We had one question about this. Um, comes from our friend. All, all these questions come from our friends at uh, our Patreon uh, family, patreon.com slash Riverfront Sensi. Kyle Kapler asked this question. Are there people who are actually upset about trading a 32-year-old utility infielder who owns a career 85 OPS plus? Now, I liked a lot of things Kyle Farmer did. Uh, we sometimes were critical of him because I thought he was given too much credit <laughs> for um, because he was gritty or something. Or, and he was, he was, you know, um, he was there every day and he worked his tail off. He did everything you could ever ask of any player for the Cincinnati Reds. Uh, and so I, I, I wish him the best. I hope he does well in Minnesota. I have nothing bad to say about Kyle Farmer, except he is what he is. And I'm afraid some people kind of lost the lost sight of what he is and tried to make him out to be more than he is, which is maybe not fair to him. But um, I, I, I tweeted something which first of all n never tweet that's always the best uh yes uh, course of action yeah as someone who as another person in the media industry never tweet yeah yeah definitely definitely don't just don't don't tweet it, nothing good comes of it but i tweeted out what turned out to be the perfect uh rorschach test of cincinnati reds fans i was trying to be sarcastic and talk about all the uh you know uh the overhype around kyle farmer and I tweeted out something like, just like the Reds trading away their best player, you know, <laughs> and, and half the people. Were there, there's no sarcasm font on Twitter, unfortunately. <laughs> exactly. And about half the people understood the sarcasm because they followed me for more than one day. Um, but there were about, about, maybe not half the responses, but there were a large number of responses that were very earnest and very, very serious because they really love California, which more power to you. I'm not, you know, but the answer to your question, Kyle, is yes, there are, were a lot of people that were upset about the Reds uh, trading Kyle Farmer. Um, I've and always been... I, the, uh, I think there's a great point you made there, though, about Kyle Farmer in that sense, and the fact that I think he's a, a perfect example of a guy that he, you're absolutely right, worked his tail off, and uh, I think he got every bit of ounce of you know what he could yes. possibly give to the Cincinnati Reds. He gave it to them every time he put that uniform on. And, you know, I think you're right, you know, sometimes it's... You know, that stuff gets a little bit lost in, in translation because you, you appreciate um, that incredible that effort that he gave in uh, 110 percent every time. You never had to doubt that Kyle Farmer was given his best. But um, there's also a bunch of talented uh, middle infielders in the system that, uh, you know, that when uh, the Reds are going to, you know, be the big red machine again, uh, it's more likely those are going to be the guys that are uh, in the lineup every day. Yeah, absolutely. My, my position with Kyle Farmer has always been, look, uh, he's a perfectly cromulent utility guy. I would love to have him on my team if he's kind of playing four different positions. You can play him four or five days a week and, you know, and get him around the line, uh, around the, uh, around the diamond. And he's going to be, you know, he's, he's going to help it. He can help a good team. He uh, can absolutely be a really team. good utility player on a postseason run team. Like there's no reason he can't be, you know, a, a 10th or 11th guy on a, a team that makes a, a postseason and, and World Series kind of run. You know, he's just not a, a starting shortstop on that team. Yeah, starting shortstop cleanup hitter like he's been in Cincinnati <laughs> exactly. often, which is, again, that's not Kyle Farmer's fault. And people nope, want to get mad at Kyle Farmer. <laughs> right. He, 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 he's worked himself into a and in, into what's turning into a pretty darn good career, and I, I echo those sentiments exactly. I wish him the best of luck in Minnesota. I hope Casey Legomina comes over and, you know, rips the cover off the ball in terms of throwing it towards a home plate and, and towards – know, being a big part of the Reds' bullpen. And, uh, yeah, no, I, I think, you know, there's no harm in that trade. I think it opens the door for exactly what we were talking about before with Ellie De La Cruz. I think that's, I think, a, a, a major part of that oh, yeah. decision. Um, and, yeah, you know, I'm wishing Kyle the best of luck. He, he gave everything he could uh, in Cincinnati. He was fun, and he was fun to watch when he was out there, that's for sure. Yeah, he, he kind of became a little bit of a punch. Not punching back, not the right word, but just because – Anytime, I, and maybe I, lightning rod. That's 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 the term, yeah. Because anytime I would say anything that I felt like was just being honest about him, which was not even critical, it was just he is who he is. He's you know he's a below average hitter. He's can play a bunch of different positions. He has he he's a major leaguer. It's not yeah. You know, um, but uh, the, uh, people want he saw him as this cleanup hitter, and because he's that kind of guy that since they always like, I, he got overrated a little bit. But uh, I, I'll, I'm always hesitant when I talk about him not, not to hey, criticize know, because he, he is who he is. In a perfect world, maybe, you know, five, six years, you know, maybe, maybe that's too long, you know, maybe hopefully, you know, you know, this, you know, the organization continues to, to, to trend in the right direction with these prospects coming up and maybe he comes back in a, in, in a couple of years and, you know, he, when, when the Reds are ready, ready for a playoff run, 
you know yeah I think, it, it, in, in, a, in a perfect world i think that's you know going right. to come back and re- return as a, as a hero once again well, I'm not sure that the, it's going to happen while he's still old, uh, young enough to play Major League Baseball. But but he's a guy that if the Reds had been good these last two or three years, would have been one of my favorite players. Because he, he wouldn't have been put in a position that he wasn't really uh, capable of. But he'd have been a guy that you could fill in. And and, and you, again, you, you like the, the attitude, the effort, the uh, the exuberance, the grit. Yeah, so, and you know what? I'll, I'll try and be as optimistic as possible. Reds fans have always been incredibly welcoming to me. Uh, uh, being a, a New York, New Jersey, and who's who's been covering the team in, in Tennessee and Florida and different parts of that. So if, if I can uh, bring out at least any little positivity I can, uh, I'm going to try and do it because uh, you guys have been great to me. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for that because, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> I, I forget sometimes. This is supposed to be fun. Uh, it's baseball. Yeah. you know. Ab- ab- uh, absolutely. It, it is supposed to be fun, but uh, life throws us off the curve, huh? <laughs> Sometimes, sometimes. Other news of the week, the Reds traded a, a relief pitcher, Dari Moretta, to the Pirates. They got infielder uh, Kevin Newman back. And Kevin Newman, 29 years old, essentially um, seems an awful lot like uh, Kyle Farmer. So, okay, fine, whatever. Um, Former I was Cape hopeful. League batting champion when I was there. 2013 Thurman Munson Cape League batting champion. Is that right? Commodores, absolutely. So, uh, so, 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 so best, of, best of luck to Kevin coming over. Cincinnati, hopefully he finds, you know, that same magic Kyle did when he came over from the Dodgers. And uh, sad to see it never really worked out for for Dowry and uh, and, and Cincinnati because I, I loved him in 2019 yeah. at Daytona Beach. He was a great part of that team. I uh, was a, a hugely successful reliever. And I, my, my only regret with him in Cincinnati is I wish they called him up earlier last uh, in 2021. Yeah, when, when he and they should have. Yeah. We were saying that here. Yeah, we the, we don't have a bullpen. He's lights out. Give him a shot. What was it going to hurt? Yeah, maybe a change of scenery. Uh, I'm I'm hopeful for him because he does have a live arm, and I would love to see him be successful. Just not against the Reds, but uh, we'll be seeing him in the future, perhaps. With with, with Newman, I think the thing might be, uh, you know, he can be Kyle Farmer without being quote unquote Kyle Farmer, which is. You know, you can play him different places. He can be your utility guy or whatever. You can, you can stick him in here and there, and nobody's going to expect more of him. Uh, I, so- I, I, I think that's exactly probably what they're are thinking of. And you know, he he's shown some hitting qualities in the minor leagues. You know, maybe something maybe something clicks in Cincinnati this year. You know, I, I hope for uh, Reds fans, and I hope for Kevin. That's the case. Well, he'll get a shot because the Reds have like I think. Seven players on their 40-man roster, I believe. Seven players. No, that's not quite <laughs> accurate. They they have 40. Um, other things this week, Nick Senzel season, uh, you know, he broke his toe at the end of the season. And so he had, did have surgery this week um, because the toe was not healing properly. But uh, evidently it was a successful surgery, and he's expected to be ready for spring training. Um, I don't know if you have any comments on Nick Senzel. Um, um, just another guy. I just I feel, I feel – terrible for and the dude you know i feel like he's another guy that's you know somewhat in the same bane of kyle farmers that trying to has tried to give every single thing he possibly can he's been third baseman second baseman center fielder you know shortstop he'll you know he's basically played every position except for you know you know left bench and catcher and uh, you know uh you know they just uh, he keep i find like every day it's a new story with him you know with an injury or you know, he's, you know, had to go under the knife or, you know, different kind of rehab. And you just, you know, I remember being in Knoxville working for the Smokies when the Reds drafted him number two in, in 16. And just, I really hope he can prefer for his sake, you know, because I know he's working his tail off to, to be out there on the field for his teammates. And he's tried everything uh, to, to be the best, uh, you know, teammate and player for the Reds he can be. It's just uh, his body has not uh, has not held up his end of the bargain. Well, I won't say much else because every, uh, every time I mention uh, Senzel here, everyone rolls their eyes. All the viewers roll their eyes because I've been touting uh, Senzel for a long time, and uh, yeah, it's been it's been sad to watch. Um, and so I don't know. Hopefully, I don't know. I keep I keep saying hopefully. Yeah, you know that's all. Uh, I mean, that, and that's in situation. It's all you sort of you, know, you can do. Just hope you know that he can stay healthy and something clicks, and uh, you know you see what everyone you know knows was possible. Yep. All right, let's try to run through a few. Uh, we just have a couple questions, then we'll get out of here. Um, see if we, and we may not be able to get to all of them, but we'll let's see. We'll see what uh, 
what looks like here. Um, the first one's going to come from Adam Fosky. Adam, we I owe you a position on the beer league softball team. Uh, Justin, I'll explain to you later what that means, but uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll do that. We'll do that next week. Uh, Adam, we'll assign your position, but we'll, we'll go ahead and try to answer your question here. Is there any player on the current Reds roster that you see the Reds extending before 2024? So essentially, uh, you know, after next season, like Stevenson, India, Green, Lodolo. After next year, the Reds' payroll significantly drops with big money off the books. Votto and uh, Mike Moustakas. And then he, 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 it's a plaintive cry here. The Reds won't be the new A's or Pirates, right? Um, <laughs> I, you know, I don't know what the I don't think I don't know the correct answer here is. I, I would never bet on the Reds signing anyone long term. Um, I think that if they really truly, like uh, Justin was saying, if they really truly believe they're that they're that close to having some of these guys start. Uh, infiltrating the uh, big league clubhouse, then it's it's a good time to start thinking about. Uh, Tyler Stevens is the first one that I would try to extend. Of course, you have the injury concerns with him, but when he's on the field, the guy is just he's unbelievable. He's just a he's a star. Um, the, you know, India, I don't know. I'd like to see more after after what happened. The injuries hurt, caused a, a sort of a slump in the, his second year, but he was looking better at the end of the season. I think we're likely to see something closer to his rookie year next year with India. Um, not not concerned man. about him yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, do you want to sign him to an, a long term? Maybe if you do, if you if you think that the Reds are close enough to do that, now might be the best time to try to get him after sort of a down year. You know, um, hey, I, I know. mean, uh, the the best way. I mean, the, the shining example of it has been. You, know, you don't have to you know look that far down south from from Virginia, not that far north from Daytona Beach. I mean, the Braves have done an amazing job of keeping their young guys that have gone up there to the major league level. And, you know, kept them for uh, conceivably under budget. I mean, obviously they've had a lot more on field success, but if that's, you know, if Lodolo and Green and Ashcraft and India and Stevenson and and, and Ellie and all these guys fulfill what we all think they can be, um, then that, that's, that's to me the, you know, the, the, the way to go. I mean, they've, they've found ways to seemingly get guys that, crazy discounts right yeah no i think it's i think it's the it's the move the difference is, uh, i guess right now is that the braves have been competitive and they're trying to win whereas last oh, year yeah. and this year the reds are not, not trying to win but at some point presumably they are going to be trying to win and so uh, they've got this sort of stable you know hunter green you want to take a chance on the arm nick Lodolo, you, uh, pitchers are but still if you yeah. can get those guys uh for for a you know, a few extra years, buy out a couple other free agent years, maybe, and get them at a, a decent rate. You have to, at some point, start thinking that. I just don't know if it's going to be. I think that could be like something that happens. I think maybe you know, randomly, maybe that's just me trying to be overly optimistic. You know, you know, Lodolo or, or, or Green or, or you know, India, you know, has you know, you know, India bounces back to what he was in twenty one and maybe even beyond, and Lodolo and Green take the next steps. You know, to prove that you know they are the the one two punch at the top of the rotation. You know, for for the next decade, then you know if, if they show that by you know from the start of the season to you know July thirty first, then might be worth taking a swing at it. Oh, absolutely, and you know the, something that is going to also play into this, I think, uh, is we sort of had this discussion in our our, our Patreon uh, group. We have a Slack channel, and we had this discussion this past week, and uh, several people were making the point that I actually agree with one hundred percent, which is that the Reds are highly they're not good but they are highly unlikely to lose 100 games again next year. They just had this big confluence of events with all these injuries, everyone injured, and just uh, maybe it'll happen again, but probably not. They had everything go wrong that could have gone wrong, and they lost 100 games. That's probably not going to happen next year. Hopefully you get a full season of India. Hopefully a somewhat full season of Stevenson. Uh, you know, you have Hunter Green, Nick Lodolo, and uh, uh, Alexis Diaz a year under their belts. Um, Graham Ashcraft. And so, Shout out 2018 Greenville Reds, Alexis Diaz. There you go. So you're you're the you're the reason he's uh, he's so good. We're going to give you credit. Hey, Introduce him to the. Bit, to I'll, I'll, I'll take the credit. I will say. I remember watching him pitch that summer and said, you know, he he's he, he's got he's got something. Uh, he reminded me a lot of his brother with his moment with his motion, and uh, I was so I was so happy to see him do what he did in the bullpen. Yeah, he's the real deal. He he, so. he deserves it. It's, it's crazy to think, you know, 2018 Appalachian League. And, you know, getting to meet you and, and, and Doug Gray and to think, you know, like four or five guys from that team, rookie ball four yeah. years ago, are, are big leaguers now. And, uh, you know, that that's it's not a mistake. That's, that's right. pretty cool. Well, and that's that's why we can hope and dream that maybe in the near future, because some of these young guys are, are uh, doing well, moving their way up the system. And, uh, 
you have to give credit to the Reds organization, certainly for that. So if if things don't go as bad as they did last year, you don't have to squint too hard to say, oh, what if they lose 89 games? Okay, well, that's a, you know, that's a big improvement. So now you can start saying, oh, the Reds can maybe start thinking, all right, so now we start plugging some of these holes, sign some of these uh, guys, and, uh, and and you're not that far from having a competitive team. You know, you had, it took 85 wins to get into the playoffs, you know. Yeah, um, you, know, you, you know, you slice, you know, eight, you know, 11 losses off 89, that's 78. You got a winning record at that point, and then all yeah. bets are off. Right. So um, that's, I don't know, that that's, is the, the sort of glass half full scenario, but I don't think it's completely unrealistic. Um, again, I, I won't trust Red's ownership and management to do it until they do it, but there is a path. There is a path. So, oh, let's see. Uh, Rich Thompson has a good question for us. General, what's your favorite Red's minor league affiliate uniform? You going with I mean, the Tugas? <laughs> I'm very biased. I mean, I, I think our color scheme and our logos, our our uniforms, what uh, we've continued to do is amazing. Uh, I I love it. Our home jerseys, our home white jerseys are so clean. The the grays on the road are nice. Um, we've got these you know neon uh, paradise green Copa jerseys that are going to become our our, our full time alternate jerseys this year. The players love them so much. Um, you know, these dark green jerseys that, you know, have been so well, and there's all these different alternate jerseys we've, we've created for, for Jackie Robinson weekend with our ballparks history and all these different things have been incredible, but there are a lot of really good ones. I mean, I think Louisville has done an incredible job uh, over the last couple of years with, with, with their branding. I love the, the lookouts, new branding, uh, over the last number of years with the, the, the look with the cap, that's just, you know, the eyes logo um, and some of the different liberties they've taken there. And, and Dayton also, it obviously does uh, a remarkable job with, with, with their uniforms day in, day out. I mean, I think I'm obviously biased, but uh, <laughs> there is a hard press to have a better organization top to bottom in terms of uh, minor league branding um from triple a down to single a so uh, i i love it all obviously i'm biased i think we're the best in daytona but uh i i love i I love everybody in the organization and that's not uh that's not me being facetious no that's where we'll go there that's the answer although i will uh, give just an honorable mention to you you mentioned them but uh, all the way back in high school which was many moons ago i had a chattanooga lookouts hat and just i love that logo and uh, i need to get a new one of those uh, because it's just i do do too i do too yeah um, Joey Gaditza, as much as I'd love to see the Reds go get, uh, Bellinger, Bellinger, Cody Bellinger, I presume he's talking about probably not his dad, Clay, um, safe to say he isn't coming to Cincinnati, correct? They'd have to spend money to get him. Now, uh, the answer is no, probably not, but man, if you could go get that guy, yeah, he, he, he fell completely off the, this is a guy that was rookie of the year at age 23. He's the most valuable player in the National League and just, he will be 27 next year and he just... I, um, I, enigma. I, I don't understand it. I mean, you know, his, his power's gone down. He's been swinging at pitches out of the zone a little bit. I mean, there's some injuries, you know, shoulder, leg injuries that may have uh, caused. Yeah, some I was gonna say, like, it feels like you know, like that that whole thing when the in the 2020 playoffs or whatever, when he like injured his shoulder, you know, jumping, celebrating a, a, a home run or a catch. I don't remember what exactly, you know, it, it was, but like. It, it, Somewhat feels like that was like a, a starting point, but man, you know, it just it's, it just it, something something just doesn't seem right. Like it, like it makes no sense that he's fallen off this much, right, in such a short period of time. Given that he's twenty seven years old, I expect there are going to be plenty of suitors. Um, so I don't know that the Reds are going to want to outbid anyone um, because it's a guy that if you could get him cheap, absolutely. Let's, let's take a, the Reds have consistently try to take flyers on guys that are you know uh, on the cheap and you know maybe fl- turn them around and. Uh, uh, trade him at the deadline or something, but man, I, I, I would absolutely take a flyer, but no, the Reds are not going to, the Reds are not going to do that, Joey. Sorry. Um, last question is from Seth. Seth, it's going to take a little bit of time to answer that. Please ask it again next week, but have fun at Hollywood studios. You ever been to Hollywood studios, uh, Justin? Uh, That's I believe I have back. It's, it's, it's been a minute since I've been there. Uh, might need to go through some family photos to, to rejog my memory. But uh, I, I definitely believe I, I've been there in, in, in my uh, in my peppered history. There we go. Well, Seth is there now. And Seth, we'll get to your question next week. Sorry, we, we really need to cut out of here. Um, Justin, is there anything I should have asked you or anything you want, else you wanted to say? 
No, I just uh, I, I really mean what I said. I, I've loved being around the Reds organization these last couple of years from people within the organization, how they've treated me from uh, you know, getting to meet Nick Crawl over the summer. He was extremely nice to uh, the players, the coaching staff, uh, to the fans themselves, uh, people like yourself that cover the team and things like that. Uh, I've been very lucky to be around uh, Reds Nation these next couple of years, and I'm really hoping that uh, the guys I've seen like Ellie and, and like, uh, you know, Reese Hines and Aguiar and, and – I can go on and on about so many different guys uh, are, are the pieces of the puzzle that everyone's been waiting for. And uh, I can't wait to see what they do in the years to come. Well, I really appreciate you giving us some of your, uh, your time today. This was fun. We really need to do it again. If you, if you yes, uh, please, are up anytime. for that, would love to do that. And uh, maybe during the season, we can check in you. I know you're busy during the season, but maybe we can find time to check make in. Time, 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 take time for you guys. Absolutely. That'd be good to get, get the, get the, the eyes and ears in uh, what's going on in single A. Uh, so I want to thank everyone for listening, watching, supporting the, the Riverfront. Please remember to subscribe to the show either on YouTube. If you're on YouTube, go ahead and smash that subscribe button or wherever your favorite podcast app is, Apple, Spotify, we're everywhere. Just search for the Riverfront or you can click the uh, link in the uh, the show notes. We're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, at Riverfront Cincy. Um, and once again, a huge thanks to our supporters at patreon.com slash Riverfront Cincy. The show would literally not be possible without the support of our family. Come join in our hijinks if you wish. Um, Justin, this was fun, man. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Chad. And thank you uh, so much, everyone who tunes into the Riverfront. And thanks for the support down in Daytona Beach. We love it. For the legendary uh, Justin Rock, his first of many uh, appearances on the show, this is Chad Dotson saying so long, everyone.